Welcome to the Hobothanga Native American podcast, where we will be discussing digital inclusion efforts in Native communities. I'm Melissa Atkins, the Training and Development Coordinator for the Native Learning Center. Today on the show, we are excited to have Davida Delmar, Digital Inclusion Manager for Amaran Critical Infrastructure. It's very excited to have you today. Could you please go ahead and tell me just a little bit about yourself and how you started? Sure. Um, my name is, of course, Tavita Del Mar. I'm a citizen of the Navajo Nation. I'm based here in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, and I, of course, work for Amerind um, ACI, which is what the acronym is for AMR Critical Infrastructure. Um, and I've been here for about a year. Um, it's been an exciting year. I've learned a lot. I came from, um, my background is actually, uh, I started with the uh, Native Nations Institute at the University of Arizona, where we um, provided resources and education on Native nation building. And before that, I was at the American Indian College Fund uh, trying to um, build higher education efforts in local high schools uh, and in surrounding um, tribal colleges and university uh, communities. So I've come from exciting you know, positions, but I think this one is very exciting because it's a, a lot of times the things and education concepts that I bring are brand new to people. Um, not to say that you know Native people haven't been doing um, a lot of digital inclusion efforts for a long time, but it's just that these new concepts and definitions are um, going to be used in policy um, right now, or are being used in policy right now. Um, but yeah, so um, that's I, the way I fell into it is that I uh, actually heard one of my colleagues, my now colleagues, talking about it, how what, the work she does and how she's amplifying digital inclusion efforts in, in her community. And I was like, why don't we have that for Indian country? Um, and so it just so happened that my pathway just kind of fell into this. So I'm really happy to be here. And just also that this, you know, this concept is so new, or I guess this field is a little bit new-ish that um, we don't have a lot of Indian country experts. So we're ho I'm hopeful to find more Indian country experts in this space too. Yeah, that's very exciting. And I'm very happy that you were able to say, hey, like, let's bring this home. Like, why not do it for all Native communities? So it's incredible and very impressive. So thank you very much for joining us on our podcast today to discuss it even further. So I would like to talk about who is ACI and NDIA for those of our viewers who don't know who they are. Sure. So Ameren Critical Infrastructure provides professional management and design services for tribal projects aimed at bringing broadband to tribal nations and businesses and communities. So Ameren overall is an insurance company and we're our whole um, our whole mission statement is basically tribe serving tribes. And we want to bring that same concept to uh, critical infrastructure too, to ensure that um, we are advocating for tribes on a consultant level, but at least it's a trusted source where people can um, find native people who are you know, involved in um, various concepts of broadband infrastructure and, um, and deploying it out into the, to the communities it serves. So um, my role in, as a digital inclusion manager is actually a little different because um, we have a partnership with the National Digital Inclusion Alliance. Um, NDIA um, is basically has um, has uh, ha has created a community of affiliates and practitioners in digital inclusion, um, where it's also it's kind of creates this uh, this network community of sharing resources and finding experts and listening to people who are uh, boots on the ground kind of thing, working in digital inclusion efforts. Um, and they reached out to ACI to find experts in Indian country. Um, so that's my role right now, basically, um, is to amplify the efforts of NDIA and then bridge it with the work we do at ACI too. So um, NDIA does this in four different ways. So they do practitioner support. So folks who, like I say, boots on the ground or people who are doing research and things like that, um, in terms of ensuring that we're supporting those practitioners. Also um, looking at policy. And what I mean by that is basically um, ensuring that uh, we demystify the policy for people who are it's actually affecting and ensuring that people are meeting the requirements that, um, that comes down the pipeline in terms of maybe there's funding coming from the federal government or state government and ensuring that people understand it and can apply for it for these different efforts. And of course, awareness. That's like, of course, the huge 
part about NDIA is to ensure that um, we uh, provide education uh, platforms for folks to learn more about digital inclusion efforts um, in, in various areas in terms of like if people are in urban settings, rural settings, like I said, tribal settings, um, and ensuring that people's uh, experiences are put on a national platform and amplified. And of course, that leads into data and research too. So NDIA also does data and research to ensure that uh, the content that we're providing is, um, is reflective of the communities that we're serving too. Well, thank you so much for that. Mm -hmm. What are some key definitions? So some key definitions to be aware of when we're looking at digital inclusion is to know that there are different conditions that are affecting communities. So for instance, digital equity is the goal. And what is digital equity? It's a condition in which all individuals and communities have the information technology and capacity needed for full participation in our society, democracy, and economy. So ensuring that we are full citizens in a sense that we can um, practice this online too. So and when we talk about digital equity, what is the problem that we're trying to solve is the digital divide. And so the digital divide is basically um, what prevents us from getting fully full participation online, whether that be through you can't afford the internet or you can't you know, um, get the right computer, you can't afford the computer that you want or that you think you might need, um, but also like just how to, how to operate these devices. There's a lot of people who don't even know how to turn on their phones or have, you know, can't hold it correctly. And that's usually not a human issue, it's a device issue kind of thing. I'll get into that. Um, so digital divide is that issue and we're hopeful to like solve that issue by doing the work. And what is the work is digital inclusion. So digital inclusion is what we do in order to achieve digital equity, um, which of course is the goal. And, and so I, I'm throwing a lot of like, you know, major terms out there, but essentially, you know, digital inclusion has those three things that I mentioned. So um, we want to ensure that folks have affordable, robust internet. Um, and you can do this a number of ways of ensuring that it's affordable as well as uh, reliable, consistent. Um, and then of course, we want to ensure that people have devices and to actually access, you know, internet to ensure that they are can make a call if they need to uh, through wireless communications, through the phone, or access education um, efforts through um, laptops, you know, which or they can do word processing and have the appropriate device for that. But of course, also ensuring that people have those skills and knowing that they can call on folks to access uh, digital inclusion, or excuse me, digital literacy skills um, so they can uh, take advantage of, of of getting online. And that can involve a lot of different things. I can get into that later. Um, but basically, the reason why we talk about digital equity is because there's, I think it's not enough for everyone to say to give everyone internet, because if we, everyone had the internet, we still wouldn't solve the digital divide. I think that's the, the point here is that if, um, if everyone had access to the internet and could use it every day, um, that still wouldn't solve the digital divide because, of course, to get on the internet, you need the devices. And then, of course, um, you need to have the skills in order to use that device. And everyone is different. <laughs> so the way my I go into the internet through, you know, my everyday working from home, um, even accessing Netflix or, you know, um, Instagram, whatever, I'm not on TikTok yet, you know, <laughs> um, is way different than what when my mom gets online, you know, so she prefers a tablet, you know, she doesn't really go into a laptop that often. Um, she uses the tablet for various things, whether it be, you know, video calling her grandkids, or she's on Pokemon Go, so she'll use it to, you know, you know, access and um, do her daily walks and catch her Pokemon. So, you know, everybody um, access, uh, accesses the internet differently and uses it differently. So I think these different definitions kind of build to the fact that, you know, we really need these different concepts to understand our, the situation that each folks are in and how, um, and how we work. So. Thank you for explaining it. Um, I know 
everyone's first go to is we'll just give everybody internet, like you said, and that's not quite the problem. So thank you for breaking it down the way that you did. It's more so it goes more into it. So what is a good resource where someone like in a native community would be able to go to to ask these type of questions? Like if they feel as if they don't know how, if they can't access a reliable computer or know how to use the reliable computer. Sure. Well, um, there's a lot of different ways, at least um, folks in native communities can do this. Um, folks even say that there's community anchor institutions and what is community anchor institution is basically um, an organization or an office or something like that that is always open, has reliable business hours and um, that kind of thing. Um, so usually like a library would be that place where people can go and access um, you know, information and talk to folks and there would be someone there to help them with that. Um, and that's not always the case with tribal communities. I'll just say that um, growing up in my community, uh, Navajo, there wasn't a library or the library was, you know, 30 miles away, which, you know, you can't really access that often. Or when you could, you kind of made a whole day out of it. Um, so I think it's knowing the reality of tribal communities. Um, that is important to kind of understand when we're looking at these different types. Um, so I think when we, the way we're solving digital divide right now is through these folks called digital navigators. And digital navigators can be housed in a lot of different places. So it doesn't have to be a library. It can be at a school. It can be, um, folks can go online and you know probably do an internet call just like we are doing. Mm -hmm. um, but then that also takes work of like, how do you get on a video call? And so, you know, we need to have uh, digital navigators in various different places to do this. And um, and I'm kind of skipping around, but <laughs> a digital navigator, I should probably define that too, is our trusted guides who address the whole digital inclusion process. So home connectivity, devices, the digital skills um, with community members through repeated interactions. So. A digital navigator, the typical, you know, one that we want to have is a person who is from the community. Um, so if you are, you know, for instance, if you're in a Navajo community or whatever it might be, someone who grew up in that community as well, possibly who is also Navajo, but who knows the, the environment and um, the barriers as well as opportunities that are possible within their community. Um, and who know people, because I think a lot of our communities are very tight knit. And um, and so the folks, I'll just say this, that tribal communities are a little different than other folks who are working in digital inclusion. So, for instance, like digital inclusion practitioners are going to be in libraries or they're going to be in uh, clinics or they're going to be in um, uh, community centers and things like that, which is fine and great. For tribal communities, it works a little differently because tribes have this concept of sovereignty, they manage their own, you know, um, services, they manage their own um, departments and things like that. And, uh, and sometimes they are trying to manage their own broadband. So in that case, um, folks who are working in broadband might be also working with digital inclusion. And that's probably a good place too, where a digital navigator can be. For, so for instance, a tribal internet service provider or a local IS, ISP, that's what we call it, internet service providers um, who are serving tribal communities um, are installing the internet, you know, setting up your modem and things like that in your home. Um, but when a person gets a smart TV or they install their new computer, who are they going to call that, you know, can help them set those devices up? It's probably going to be the same person who set up their modem, who installed their internet. Um, and so I think that's really important to kind of to understand about tribal communities is that people who are working in broadband also mix into this concept of digital inclusion efforts. And it's important to include them in the conversation too. Um, even though we do say that where can people find, you know, more resources in their community, libraries, clinics, like I keep repeating, but also their um, local ISP is probably a reliable resource too because they insult the internet. And not to say that everybody does that, but it kind of, you know, naturally comes out that way. This, and it's a lot of things that we've learned in, when working with folks. 
Thank you very much for that. And thank you very much for being able to be a reliable source to refer back to, because I know it can be very stressful when you don't have internet or when you can't access it. Or like you said, certain communities are very far away from the nearest library like you were. So it's great to have someone do that. You can find a way to access and get help and ask the questions that you need to ask. So is there anything else you would like to discuss about a digital navigator? Well, so I should say that um, the reason why ACI and NDIA are um, close partners is because we have uh, a network called the Digital Navigator Core, National Digital Navigator Core, which are serving rural and tribal communities. Um, so it's a it's a grant funded um, effort, um, which is we're really excited about. Um, and we have seven sites that are serving tribal communities, which I'm really excited about. So they're folks who have a full-time digital navigator um, who are, who are about to have a di full-time digital navigator. And we're learning a lot from their interactions with people about how they're getting people online, how their um, digital literacy classes are going, but also how digital navigators are working too. So just to kind of put that up, out there, we have folks with the Alaska Federal Nation of Natives up in Alaska, which is great. Um, Cayuse Native Solutions in the Northwest, Cherokee Nation in um, the middle of the country, um, Gila River Indian Community um, near me, just right near me, mm -hmm. uh, Hoopa Valley Tribe in Northern California, uh, Lummi, um, the Lummi Indian Business Council up in Washington, and the Pueblo of Jemez. Uh, so all those sites have a full-time digital navigator. I know, it's so exciting. And we're learning so much from them. Um, and case in point is um, our digital navigator in Hoopa Valley Tribe. So like I said, the people who are working with Broadbent are also working digital inclusion efforts. They are actually a uh, um, Acorn Wireless, is who they're who basically who is under Hoopa. Um, and they have a grant that they're, hopefully installing fiber into their into their um, community right now. But they also, of course, uh, manage a, a wireless network within their tribe, too. And I'm excited because I'm going to go there in a couple of weeks and learn more. But this is my limited knowledge for now. But um, digi their digital navigator is signing people up through ACP. And what's ACP? It's um, the Affordable Connectivity Program, which is a federal program from the FCC um, where folks can uh, sign up based on various different factors and get um, a reduced, basically reduced amount off of their internet bill. So folks who are not living on tribal lands and who qualify can get $30 off of their internet bill, which is great. But folks who are on tribal lands can get up to $75 off. And that's like a huge savings for a lot. Yeah, exactly. Um, and there's another, piece of it that I won't go into, but um, there's a, also a chance you can get a device with that program too. It's not common, but um, that is under the Affordable Connectivity Program or ACP. So when you hear ACP in your community and, you know, can people sign up and things like that, you know, it, it does take, I mean, it's worth it to kind of um, do a double take and listen to what people are offering um, because there's a chance you can get, you know, a huge lift off in terms of your internet bill, especially if you live on tribal lands. Um, and of course, uh, NDIA has a resource page for that, which you can go on to digitalinclusion.org and just look up ACP or the Affordable Connectivity Program. And they have a lot of resources there where you can find out more about what the ACP is and how you can sign up and the link to where to sign up and that kind of thing. So back to what I was talking about with Hoopa. Um, so their digital navigator is understanding a lot from the provider side, the ISP side of signing folks up, but also how it's helping their uh, community um, better afford the internet. And so it's it's a it's a it's an awesome effort for them to kind of have this resource and relieve a lot of their the burden on terms of their community members. And so I think it's something an effort that they're excited about in terms of investing their time and effort to sign people up. Also, that where they hope it lasts, because that's the other thing too. We hope this program lasts too. Um, and that's not to say that all tribes are going to sign folks up for the ACP. I know that some tribes um, offset already offset a lot of people's utilities, and that includes um, internet with um, other revenue costs or other revenue streams within their tribe. Um, 
for instance, I think, uh, well, I'm not going to name any tribes, but I just know that happens where tribes are able to like provide internet for their community. And it's an exciting thing. And I wish I was part of that tribe. I'll just say Navajo doesn't do that, but whatever. <laughs> Maybe they'll get to that. <laughs> but they see that it's, it's an important resource, right, to have internet there. So they make that investment in various ways. But um, if you're not part of a tribe who does already, ACP is a great way to kind of um, uh, reduce your monthly bill if you qualify for it. So I'll say one more time, ACP. That's just incredible. Like, it's amazing that not only can they go to you to help learn how to use your device or if you need help with certain things, but they can also save you money. So that's I know that's always nice. Um, is there any way that you could please discuss or elaborate a digital inclusion ecosystem? Oh, sure. Um, so digital navigators coordinate a lot of the community resources. So they're able to kind they're, they're, they, they do this thing called asset mapping. So they're able to say like, OK, so who in our community is doing just helping our community in various ways? So that could be the Boys and Girls Club. That could be IHS or the tribal um, clinic in your community. It could be the, um, the library, of course. It could be um, if for folks who have it, the um, tribal college and university, the TCU that's in your community, um, the high school, you know, different schools in your community. Um, and so those are the folks who are helping people get on the internet or need the internet in order to like serve their, you know, their clients or the community in general, right? And oftentimes people forget that there's other things in their community that also are affected by the internet that can be amplified if we all get online. So for instance, um, when we talk about um, tribal council, tribal council has, you know, a, a huge uh, responsibility to um, pass laws that are going to affect community members. It's important that there's um, interaction between community members and themselves and knowing what their experiences are. So they're in a way also, you know, looking to ensure that people get online safely and um, affordably, but then also to provide resources that can be helpful online too. So people often forget, at least the non-native community often forgets that 70% of natives live off the reservation. So case in point, me, I live in Phoenix, but my tribe's up in Navajo Nation, right? Um, and I still want to be, you know, connected to, you know, what my community is doing, how, you know, services are being provided. And that was like a huge thing for me in terms of like COVID-19 pandemic is like, I want to share my, not only my grandma and my aunties are being taken care of, but their community is taken care of, right? But how do I find more information online, right? People are on Facebook and people are trying to get online. So I think in that way, Folks are looking to the internet to find more information, more resources. And that is case in point for tribal government too. They want to ensure that, you know, um, they're getting the right services they need, that their tribal councils, um, you know, uh, advocating for them. And so some tribes are even putting a lot of their government services online too, where people can, um, you know, find out more information, um, have a portal that's just for tribal citizens where they can sign up for services. Um, such as, you know, things that affect families or whatever it might be onto these different government resources. So using that piece there, they're also involved within, you know, how people get online. And I'm going to talk to another issue too, which is safety issues too. So for instance, um, people, uh, people often forget that we need um, wireless and um, internet connections in terms of ensuring our safety. So if we're out and we're, you know, need help or something like that, ensuring that they're, the wireless is connected, that we have access to the police, to medical services if we're in an emergency. Um, and, then we've, and then also just telehealth, you know, just if it's not an emergency, those non-emergency things. Of we can get online and talk to a doctor um, and talk about different things and not have to travel, you know, 300 miles just to get to a clinic and see someone in person. So... As I said, there's all these different pockets and departments and organizations who are working in, in um, digital inclusion efforts who aren't really calling it that. They're calling it, you know, um, you know, safety issues or health issues or cultural preservation issues. But all of these are affected by how we interact online, how we're um, using the tools and technology 
at our grasp to um, amplify different efforts we're looking at. So a digital inclusion ecosystem is something that is going to impact the tribal community working together to access health, you know, to access job opportunities or workforce development or um, ensuring our elders are safe, or getting the care they need and um, ensuring cultural, cultural preservation is there. And I think a key piece of organizing those efforts and ensuring that people are all these organizations are working together to ensure that we are working within online and um, online access is through our tribal leadership. So tribal leadership is huge in terms of how um, our community letter, our community members are understanding the needs and what is the core of that need is probably online access, you know. So I think digital inclusion ecosystems uh, kind of define that in a sense where that we can have all these departments and still work together to like create an ecosystem where digital inclusion is always at the you know forefront of how we provide our resources and know that um, it's important in our lives. So um, I don't know if you have any questions about that, but that's the best I could do in terms of defining it right, right now. No, I, I thought that was beautiful. I thought the way you explained it was perfect. How kind of you know all the different organizations in yourself like create that ecosystem where you can kind of stuff like sustain everybody and where you have everything kind of set up that everyone can afford internet access and have a reliable source to ask questions even if you're unable to travel to a location because like you said a lot of people live far away so if an emergency happens you may not be able to drive to get somewhere you'll need to call for help so it's just making sure that all of those functions are taken care of so i thought you explained it perfect beautifully was there anything else you wanted to say real quick sure um so i just want to say that of course NDIA is a um as a very good resource if you want to learn more um digitalinclusion.org you can go online and um and find out all a lot about these concepts of course and as well as join the community. So um, if you want, you can join as a nonprofit or um, there's other ways you can get involved. You can get out on our listserv and find other people in the community doing this. We also have a digital inclusion working group, Indigenous Digital Inclusion Working Group. The reason why we call it Indigenous is because we want to help other folks in all parts of the world. So that's Native Hawaiians, um, even folks like up in Canada and things like that. So if you call it a tribal one, it's only going to be, you know, just US, so we want to open up to other folks. And real quick, you know, um, our vision for that is to, for indigenous communities to have affordable, robust broadband services, access to appropriate devices, trusted training and support to meet their educational, health, economic, cultural, and social needs while advancing the uses and impacts of technology and society in this digital age. So that's the vision of this group. Um, it's basically to, um, it's almost like a social, you know, um opportunity for people just to get online once a month it's it's wednesdays uh, at 11 a.m pacific time um where we just get together for an hour share resources know what other people are doing and share stories too if that's also you know you know i think a lot of native people like to share their stories and share where they're coming from and that's really important and so our mission and this is a little long, but I'll say it anyway, um, is to bridge the digital divide for indigenous communities through connecting nations and organizations to address challenges, barriers, and best practices with the overall goal of improving policy, um, their internal governance capacities, and strengthen the political, economic, and community development foundation. So Native nations will leverage the closure of the digital divide to strengthen self-determination and assert digital sovereignty. And I think that's another thing that, you know, kind of is the underlying concept in a lot of these different spaces or different concepts I'm talking about that we have the capacity, we have the knowledge to ensure that everybody gets online. Um, and of course, there are things that we need to be aware of that that it's just, that we get online safely, that we get online um, efficiently, effectively, you know, things like that. Um, ensure that we are, um, all of our citizens are getting aligned to, um, to, um, it's going to affect other places, other pieces of who, how we operate as a tribe or as a community. And I think, of course, 
that sovereign issue is always going to be at the forefront too. Um, so I encourage everybody if you want to, you know, get involved and um, <laughs> and be a part of that, you're totally open to joining. You can uh, contact me. Um, you can email me, and I can say it right now, which is d d e l m a r at amarin dot com. Um, please reach out. Um, you can also find me in various other ways. LinkedIn, you can find me there. Um, so yeah, uh, if you have more questions about what this means or where you can find out more information, um, I'm open to learn. You know, sharing this information. There's other organizations working in digital inclusion too. I'll say that. Um, so if you're interested in broadband and you want to learn more and you're looking in terms of amplifying your efforts at the tribal level or you work for your tribe in the broadband office, I think the Tribal Broadband Bootcamp, which is run by Connect Humanity and the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, is a great opportunity. It's like a boot camp that lasts for a couple days. The next one is actually going to be in Hoopa Valley Tribe. Um, and uh, basically people who don't know a lot about broadband or just want to learn more or want to share their expertise can go there. And there's folks who are going to, you know, demystify the internet. And you're going to find a lot of good friends and you're going to join a network where we're solving problems by just, you know, uh, by, by just that uh, connection. And it's interesting because people who join the boot camp um, oftentimes are neighboring tribes um, who don't know what each other are doing, but they're only like 50 miles away. And they come to this camp and they're like, oh, you're working in broadband. This is what we're doing. What are you doing? Or what vendor works for you? You know, and, you know, the exchange is kind of information that can help be helpful to both. And they even amplify their ecosystem a little bit more where they can talk to folks within their state of like how they're working with state efforts, also working within their community to solve the digital divide. So, so that's another resource, too, that I'm sort of a part of, but someone else runs it if people want to learn more about broadband efforts. So. Yeah, that's incredible. And just one more time, if people want to access you or ask you any questions, how can they do that again? Sure. So uh, you can email me. So um, d d e l m a r at amarin dot com or d delmar, which is my name. So first initial and last name. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn too. Um, don't be a stranger. Um, uh, please don't Facebook me. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but and of course you can find me on uh, if you uh, go to digitalinclusion.org if you fill out like an information sheet and say like I heard her on a podcast or something they'll definitely connect us right away. So thank you so much for that. Thank you again for joining the podcast today. Everything you said was incredibly crucially important. So thank you so much for being able to share your insight. And that brings us to the end of this episode. Thank you to Davida so much for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed the episode. As always, thanks for listening to Hope a Thing and Native American Podcast. If you enjoy our show, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Also visit our website, www.nativelearningcenter.com to find information on upcoming webinars and virtual trainings. Be sure to come back for more content.